Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hiyam Khouri. I'll be chairing this session. So the first presentation is entitled uh, Innovation Management, Exploring the Synergy Between Management Innovation and Technological Innovation in the Context of Global Value Chains. And our presenter is uh, Muhammad Wafai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I go with Hassan, so if you want to call me Hassan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hiyam. Thank you. Uh, well, let me start by saying I'm very happy being here in Bahrain. This is my first time. And uh, so far, it's, uh, it's very impressive. Uh, very well-organized conference, uh, attention to details. I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you for the opportunity, actually. Um, who I am? My name is Hassan Wafai. Muhammad Hassan Wafai, I go with, with, with Hassan. Uh, I'm an uh, associate professor at uh, Royal Road University. Royal Road University, uh, this is a picture of Royal Road University. Uh, it's based in Victoria, British Columbia. It's one of the five research intensive university in uh, British Columbia. The campus uh, considered one of the most beautiful campus in North America. If you see the movie X-Men, it was shot here. This is Hatley Castle, a very famous uh, place. Uh, um, I'm a associate professor. I'm also leading the DBA program, the DBA program, Doctor of Business Administration. It's a combination between uh, it's a hybrid program that combines the strengths of PhD, the rigor of PhD, and the practicality of conventional DBA. Uh, Victoria is quite far from here, 24 hours. It took me 24 hours to arrive here yesterday, but I can tell you it's worth it. So I'm talking today about innovation management, the big title, but let me just summarize it. It is a conceptual paper, and, and by the way, um, uh, I graduated from Salford. Hassan was my supervisor in 2000, <laughs> and, I, and he's still my mentor and my friend. <laughs> Uh, it's a conceptual paper. Uh, it investigates the relationship between three elements innovation management, technology management, and sustainable competitive advantage. When I'm talking about sustainable competitive advantage, uh, I don't have, I don't have a, a pointer, so I'm going to move around here. Uh, uh, sustainable competitive advantage, I'm defining it in the context of this, uh, of this paper as upgrading into global value chain. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Uh, but is that important? <laughs> the question, is that important? I'm going to talk about the theoretical implication or theoretical contribution, but let me first start with a practical implication. Uh, relatively, there is a short span. I mean, there, the, the, the uh, starts up that are based on technology, they have short lifespan, five to seven years, you know, normally. And the most things they could achieve to be observed by one of those big players to be acquired, normally USA player to be acquired. Uh, these companies build their success on technology. Having a technology as a core competitive advantage, but they fail to uh, develop management practice to uh, sustain that technology. The second practical implication, government policy geared toward te technology-based innovation. At least in North America, most of the grant schemes supporting technology, any company, any institution that invests in technology, investing in some, a certain product, they are funded, normally they are funded. Few actually, few schemes uh, uh, that support improving management practices. A third point, which is very much Canadian based, my research is based in Canada, uh, but it, is, it, 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 it has that implication to uh, 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 North America as well. Most of small, medium-sized enterprises have not been able to plug into a global value chain. And uh, according to uh, a statistic Canada, only 90% Oh, not only, 90% of small, medium-sized enterprises have not been able to participate in a global value chain. In terms of theoretical implication, I'm going to discuss them now. Let me start with some key highlights from literature, technological innovation, literature around innovation, which is very fast, rich, growing, uh, it's a sexy topic, everyone's talking about innovation. 
Most research is based on innovation as technology, has a tangible uh, uh, product, a, t a tangible process. It can be codified, it can be observed. So if you look at the literature, actually this is a way being uh, addressed or this is a way being discussed, the technology. Uh, and that is focusing on that linear approach of R&D that produce product surface that add economic values. Only, interestingly enough, 10 years ago, there's, there was like a sudden interest in, okay, let's move from that technology-based innovation, let's think about how we work, and how that could influence the technology or the technological-based innovation. The, the work around that, actually, it's, uh, it's based on the uh, social technical theory. They argue such a technical theory that technological innovation associated with hardcore management innovation associated with social system and these two should coexist. But there's no, there was no, or there is no further research beyond this point. Technical, uh, non-technological innovation, they have different names in literature to describe it, institutional innovation, uh, administrative innovation, different terms. The most common terms, at least in, in recent literature, is to use, it, to use management innovation. That include management practice, organizational routine, structural procedures, leadership behavior, organizational learning. Of course, with any topic that is uh, gaining attraction. There is a recent systematic literature review. I'm referring to the most influential literature review uh, uh, which has been done in this field. So talking about the relationship, there is very little research around the relationship between technological innovation and management innovation. What we know, what literature tells us, that these two should co coexist. But the question, should we have first technological innovation and improve management innovation or the other way around? Put it simply, we talk about disruptive technology. Do we need to have disruptive culture in order to adopt disruptive technology or not? Or maybe this is, is, it, it is not important. So this is the first point which this research will contribute to. The second one, innovation performance relationship. Also this topic is um, um, important. There's a lot of research around it, but most of the research taking the perspective of innovation as technology-based innovation and performance is mainly financial performance. Very little research that investigates the relationship between management innovation and performance that goes beyond financial uh, KPIs. So this is also a very, interestingly enough, an important topic that has not been addressed in the literature. When we talk about uh, performance that goes beyond financial uh, indicators, we talk about organizational capability, improvement in competitiveness, but these are very holistic terms that are uh, difficult to be, cap to be captured because these terms are related to context. But how can we define context? Context is very difficult to be defined. So in this research, we incorporated the, 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 the notion or the theory of a global value chain to capture the concept of context. The concept of a global value chain, GVC, uh, it's an, an analytical tool that describes the movements of goods surfaces between different functions. That's different from supply chain management. It's related, but it's different. Supply chain management is very much industry level. Here we're talking about clusters of organizations that are function based. So a global value chain is a very uh, popular research to investigate trade relationship between nations. So the uh, global value chain research, uh, contribution to global trade, to uh, free trade agreement, TPP agreement, Canadian European agreement, USA European agreement, the, T, uh, the, the, the global value chain. There's little research though that's done at organizational level. 
two concepts I would like to highlight from the big theory of a global value chain. The concept of engagement that include participation and, uh, and upgrade. Participation is ability to plug into the value chain, to directly export import from a, a, a player within the global value chain. That's participation. While upgrade its ability to move up the value chain. I mean to move from assembly based uh, uh, company to original equipment manufacturer to original uh, design manufacturer to original brand manufacturer. So these two concepts, I'm going to employ them in the theoretical proposition that I'm going to propose. Another concept is governance. And the theory of global value chains offer us a very robust way to capture context through understanding governance. And here we have five different, five, two, four, five, exactly, five different types of governance that's based on how complex the product is, how a uh, complex relationship between suppliers and, and, uh, and, and customer can be and the competence of supplier. For example, in a market governance, uh, we talk about commodity product. Product is not complicated. It can be communicated. I mean, the features around product can be communicated easily. So we're talking about a very specific relationship, commodity-based relationship between so many suppliers and so many customers. That's different when we have a key or lead firm like Walmart or oh, five minutes already. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So this is a proposed relationship. I'm going to talk about three scenarios we are proposing. The first scenario, organization develops or acquire technological innovation without rethinking their management practices. They acquire technology, but they don't invest in improving the way of work. We are arguing here in this research saying that this kind of company can participate into a global value chain, can produce product that's valid by other players but could cannot upgrade into a global value chain. We are arguing that there are two different types of governance most likely will emerge if companies adopt a company adopt only technology without investing into in their uh, 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 management practices. Scenario two, organization develop management innovation without investing in technology. Also the same, the company here we are saying they will achieve competitive parity, but they wouldn't be able to achieve breakthrough improvement because they don't have the technology. They have the system, but they don't have a, a technology, especially in the short term. Scenario three, which is the ideal scenario, saying if company is able to develop both kind of innovation, then the company can participate and upgrade, produce added value surface or product. I'm going to move a little bit quickly here to discuss a next step. So uh, this is actually a next year proposal to, uh, for grants. So the next uh, stage, which is research design, it has two phases, the qualitative phase and the quantitative phase, the qualitative, we are going to investigate four case studies. Each case will represent one of these scenarios and we have one extra case to confirm, to validate variables and then we do a quantitative analysis using a structure equation modeling, uh, using the data from Statistic Canada and to define variables here, we define specific variable based on the survey that Statistic Canada used. What are the variable for participation and what are the valuable variable for upgrading? So to say a company is able to participate means directly export goods, outsourcing, indirectly export goods, purchasing input directly from supplier outside Canada. Upgrading is ability to move up the value chain uh, uh, from, uh, as I said, uh, assembly manufacturer, original equipment manufacturer, uh, OBD, ODM. Criteria for technological innovation, ability to, we're looking for evidence, company that has been able to develop, successfully deployed advanced technology, facility upgrade, process product technology, that's a conventional way. This is a technology, uh, technological innovation. They have R&D department. 
non-technological innovation. We're looking for evidence, and again, these criteria are based on the survey that's already administered by the government. So we're taking the data from, uh, from there. A company that has been able to modify existing practices or deploy best practices, uh, deploy successfully deployed competitive strategy, uh, build relationship, and has clear key uh, uh, strategic objective performance indicators implemented through organization or through value system. So this is the next step. And I'm here presenting this conceptual paper. I'm looking for feedback as we are moving to the next step. On time? One more minute. There you go. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You're very much correct. It is, we are bounded by the data. Did you think about using it as a technique? Or maybe, maybe other techniques are using what's the best? Uh, Yes, correct. I haven't thought about it, to be, uh, to be frank. It's very in in interesting to think up about it. Uh, it will be interesting to see how it fit within the global value chain literature, because that's the concept for the first time in incorporating the GVC literature into innovation management literature, combining this. But thank you for the point. It, it, it is interesting to think about how the capability <coughs> maturity model, which we work together on. <laughs> yes, correct. Okay, well, thank you, Rassan. How about the hybrid model? I mean, uh, making use of form, uh, I mean, the, the most mature aspects of one, and combining them with the uh, other mature aspects of the other. Again, if we're going to quality, I mean, it, it works fine when we go with case study. Case, case study, holistic approach, and you can argue. But when we go to quantitative data, we need to have a hard measure. What does mean mature, and how mature is the mature? and how that can be measured based on the survey, because at the end of the day, we need to define these variables to put them in the structure equation modeling. So we're very much bound by the model, the structure equation modeling, the software we're using, which is not exactly flexible, but it's, it, 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 it's a very good point. Very good point, thank you. Thank you, important question. Thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, socialization process, the way we think about it, it is about it's a management innovation. So part of, of management of innovation is ability to have the system to embrace technology, to communicate technology. So it's been implicitly, implicitly incorporated under management innovation. Uh, does that answer your question, or kind of? Okay, that's a good point. Well, in the literature, the most dominant way to see the relationship between innovation performance is innovation financial performance. There are a lot of researchers, I mean, study building the relationship between technological innovation and uh, financial performance. Interestingly enough, there is very little research that measure relationship between other type of innovation, the holistic type of innovation, the soft innovation, and competitiveness in, in general. So once you focus on financial indicators, you foc you're, you're focusing really on a short-term success, whether you are able to you know, gain some value through using technology, increasing a profit, da, 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 da. But how does that mean in the, in the long term? There's a very little research, and mainly because there is no way to capture context. This is very difficult. So in, 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 in education, they have a different context compared to construction, compared to manufacturing, to service, government, public. This is why we incorporate the global value chain as a model to capture the context. And that's the reason why we're bringing this literature to bring to, to capture that context through the uh, upgrading, uh, participating, and the governance. Good point. This indeed they, they, they do. And this is what we are saying. This behavioral aspect has not been captured in literature. 
Yeah, yes, sure, but you said that the technological aspect in the literature has been captured. Has been proven. Correct. I'm, I didn't, I'm, if, if I say that, so I'm, <laughs> I wasn't clear. I'm sorry for that. All of I'm saying that it, it, the existing literature argues, or actually um, existing literature is mainly around relationship between technological innovation and financial performance. That is the existing literature. Very few research that investigate relationship between non-technological innovation, including behavioral aspect, correct, and non-financial measures. And the reason for that, it's very difficult to capture, very difficult to create, to have, I mean, I mean data that measures behavioral aspect and measure non-performance indicators, and non-financial indicators. So it's, yes, yeah, very strong, so I maybe misunderstood it. So you're saying like it's the technology aspect is like it's the most like mentioned. It is it is the oh, most cited. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's a most it is a mainstream research. Thank you. If you have any other questions for Hassan, maybe you can ask him during the break. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our presenter is from ASU. Uh, is Muhammad Sultan, and he'll be talking about modern paint and modern art, synthetic paint media, and their impact on art of the 20th century. Good evening. Um, my name is Muhammad Sultan, I'm at the uh, University of Applied, uh, Applied Science University. Uh, I'm uh, acting head of the Department of Design and Art, and today I'm, I will talk about modern paints and how they affected and influenced the course of the history of the uh, art, of the fine art. Uh, thank you for waiting. Uh, okay, so this study is an, an overview of uh, the history of uh, synthetic paint media. Um, these revo revolutionary uh, media uh, had a great influence on fine art. Uh, this uh, research, this study, provides historical review of modern paints and provides uh, an insight into the introduction of acrylic paints for being particularly important in the course of modern uh, art. Research aims and objectives. An inquiry for this study is raised. The inquiry is about the status quo of synthetic paints and the context of the history of fine art. In order to tackle this, uh, such an investigation, it was essential to trace back uh, the origins and early history of such materials. It's important to know how they were developed and when and where they were first manufactured. It's also important to obtain facts on how they were perceived uh, from their outset. Subsequently, it's important to understand the role of synthetic paint media and fine art by exploring uh, its early adoption and painting by fine artists. Uh, this research is based upon uh, an interdisciplinary methodology that uh, combines literature review, documentary analysis, and I've done some survey as well. An important source of information was historical newspapers patents, catalogs, and other periodicals as well. These sources provided uh, a wealth of, uh, of information uh, on the early history of modern paint media and their development. So what paint media mean? Actually, anyone who used paint before, I think we all did, maybe, even indirect, indirectly. In our houses, we use house paints, for example. And paint uh, are combined by two main uh, factors, medium and pigment. Pigments can be organic or inorganic pigments. What's the main difference between synthetic and natural pigments? That synthetic pigments are manufactured in laboratories. Actually, the first, uh, let's say, artificial pigment started by the Egyptian plume 
thousands of years ago in ancient Egypt. So, paint can be oil paints, can be acrylics, can be house paints, can be a lot of uh, uh, things that can be uh, used in art and other uh, uh, things like uh, house painting or something. So, uh, for oil paints, for example, they are traditionally made using drying oils, for example. And uh, there are uh, other paints like uh, gouache, uh, aquarelle, that's used gum arabic for the paints. And we have here one of the striking examples on uh, artificial paints that we are using now uh, um, in, in wide world, uh, let's say. For example, we have the lapis lazuli. It's natural state here. This is the main uh, ultramarine that were used in the past in a lot of paintings, actually. But it was very expensive. It was very expensive. It was more expensive than gold. So by the mid-19th century, uh, a scientist discovered that it can be replaced by much cheaper uh, pigment, which it's called now artificial ultramarine. It's much cheaper that a lot of artists, like impressionists, for example, they used it uh, for uh, their paintings extensively. Here we see uh, an old painting uh, by Vermeer. It's the famous girl with a beer earring. The lapis lazuli, the uh, uh, natural pigment of uh, uh, ultramarine, was used here in the turban. And in this comparatively modern paint, painting, it's uh, by Bissarro. And the artificial ultra ultramarine was used in this painting. So it's the, the quality of color is the same, but a lot of difference in terms of expensive uh, matter and uh, uh, being available for the artist can be uh, noticed. We have also another example, another striking example that uh, killed one of the most famous persons in the history. We have Shields Green. Everybody maybe knew about Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Uh, to, uh, until recently, no one knows exactly why Napoleon was dead. He was killed, maybe? or uh, he su committed suicide, nobody knows. But uh, recently, research discovered that Shields Green, that uh, consists of cyanide, actually killed Napoleon Bonaparte. So that pigment was replaced later by other pigment. It also affected the course of the history of art because it was very difficult to find a good green for artists. Now we have cobalt green. It's a, a good replacement for the green. Uh, and now it's used extensively in paintings. What about the modern paints? We have sequence of history, uh, of historic, historical uh, dates that we can find that modern paints was manufactured. For example, first we have natural cellulose paint uh, in the 1920s, the alkyd paint in 1930s, BVA emulsion paint 1940s, and then acrylic paints. One in the form of solution paint and the other in the form of emulsion paint in the 1950s, of course. These paints were first manufactured as industrial paints. They were used for car painting, for uh, household uh, paints. But we have had, by this era, a very innovative artists, like Sequeiros, for example, the American-Mexican artist. And we have had Picasso, Pablo Picasso. He used household uh, paint extensively. And a lot of artists actually used house paint at, the t at this time. Later, someone 
a very innovative person, actually. His name was Leonard Bokur. He started to discover the very important prison of acrylics. Uh, someone called Rom, he was a, a German scientist in the beginning of the 20th century, he, this, he uh, let's say, invented the uh, acrylic and the byproducts of the acrylic uh, pigment, a medium. Acrylics were used actually for plastic sheets of the airplanes of uh, the uh, American Air Force, for example. But later, by uh, let's say tweaking it chemically, uh, Bokur started to use it as a medium for the new pigment, which actually started a new era, new real era for fine art. What was the importance of acrylics? Acrylic paint was a very good replacement of oil, actually. So uh, it started to change a lot of ideas by the artist at that time, the modern artist. Uh, something like photorealism, for example, a very important artist, art movement started to emerge by combining this modern paint with spraying techniques. So they started to make huge paintings, exactly like Sekiris did in his murals in America, in the US. In US. He started to use nitrocellulose paints, the household paints, and those people started to use acrylic paints. Later on, the acrylic was a hit. So we see a lot of our other com companies, like the Liquitex, for example, started to manufacture uh, the acrylic, but in a heavy-bodied form. So now we have an acrylic that exactly Mimi, uh, mimic the oil paint. Here we see Picasso and the Ripolin. It's a, it was a household paint that he used. And we here see Jackson Bollock, uh, who used a lot of techniques, especially this dribbing technique on uh, the ground. And Sekiros and his, uh, let's say, gang who used a lot of techniques, modern techniques like spraying and household paints and the murals. And until the 1960s when the photorealists emerged and combined um, acrylic with the air brushing and their canvases. And we also have other uh, artists, uh, abstract artists like Peter Sedgley, for example, who used acrylics. We have Francis Bacon, the very famous artist who used acrylics. So, Acrylics now is a very good replacement because a lot of things. For example, it dries fast, faster, much faster than oils. The yellowing of the acrylic is much better, or it doesn't yellow at all, maybe, comparing to oil paints. So another way of looking to, to it, conservation will be um, not as difficult as with uh, t traditional techniques in fine art. Here we can see Chuck Close, one of the prominent artists in the photorealism art movement. He used air brushing techniques and the acrylics to make his huge paintings at the 70s. Okay, we finished now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. I remember in the uh, um, arc, so when we were drawing, we yeah. used to use, for example, uh, tea for painting and giving colors to our drawings, yes. tuskers and things like that. Uh, that would be considered, for example, like an organic, uh, organic type of uh, paint. Uh, Absolutely. Color. Yeah, they, they, call, they call it dye, D-Y-E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that one of the main motives behind having the synthetic uh, paints is the scarcity and uh, the economic aspect of the, uh, of the organic paints themselves. Uh, yeah. Why they were so expensive? Was it because of processing the color itself or the paint itself or the scarcity of the material? What were the reasons behind the, the high value of, of well, these? Uh, 
Yeah. Yes, yes, very good question. Thank you. Uh, not all the pigments were expensive or were uh, scarce, uh, scarce. Actually, some of them were made of precious stones like lapis lazuli that we've seen in the, in the presentation. So they were expensive to many artists. Actually, we have uh, had uh, people like uh, the Medici family in Italy and the Renaissance who used to pay a lot of, of money to Da Vinci and other artists to use such material. So for the common artist, yes, it was expensive. But there were cheaper uh, colors, but the palette was very narrow, you know. The colors, they were very narrow until maybe the time of the Impressionists. They used a lot of colors now. We have a lot, a plethora of colors, if you can see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. Well, acrylics actually not 100 years oh, from now, you say. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Well, if uh, nothing more innovative than acrylic emerge, then acrylic will be, uh, has the same importance as it has now, I think. Uh, did I understand your question right? Um, partly. <laughs> sorry? Partly. Partly, yeah, sorry. If you can repeat it then, because but I didn't hear it. Would uh, artists still use acrylic? Because yeah. More developed, you say? Yeah, more developed after 100 years. So people will not use acrylic because it's so expensive. Like nobody can afford it much. I, see, I, I, I hope some, something more cheaper than acrylic will emerge. I'll try to do something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, with the yeah. uh, like virtual reality and all these kind of things, yeah. uh, where would we put like the, the, the physical paint in the future, for example? Would yes. we need these physical paints or we can do everything like digital. digital, that's right, Free absolutely. Like that. Yes, it can happen, of course. It can happen. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, next presenter is uh, Catherine from uh, the American University of Sharjah, and she'll be talking about creativity, design, management, innovation, enterprise, and entrepreneurship. So yeah, um, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm uh, delighted to say it's my first time in Bahrain, but hopefully not my last, inshallah. Um, so what I've put together, I suppose it's not really a research paper, so apologies, but it is a conversation starter about lots of different subject areas that are certainly important to the subjects of this conference. And I think maybe what I'm doing is taking a slightly more human-centric view than technology-centric, but that's okay. So the purpose of this is, um, you know, if you want to in the paper, it's written as a series of, I think, 10 headings, all that are like mini essays. But the point of now, and if you speak to me after, is just a conversation starter on how some of this might fit in with some things that you're looking at in a much more specialized way. Um, I'm a great fan of Theodore Zeldin, who says that conversations, uh, when minds meet, they don't just exchange facts, they transform them, they reshape them, they draw different implications from them, and they engage in new trains of thought. Conversations don't just reshuffle cards, they create new cards. So hopefully we can talk about technology, innovation, entrepreneurship in a, um, in, with some different insights. So there's, um, these are the key words I'm going to talk about today, very briefly. And the first is just talking about the importance of the creative industries. Um, because we know how important technology is to innovation, but it's also important to creativity and national economies. So taking an example from Austria, looking at their creative industries, um, creativity and innovation are desirable assets because they are excellent ways to develop competitive advantage in terms of culture, expression, but also talents. And from a business point of view, it's also incredibly important to develop new products, services, companies, and brands that become, that go from local to global um, and start to think about how to impact much wider ecosystems through the commercial agendas of companies, but how those also hit with um, regional and governmental agendas. So in Austria, as well as having technology strategies, they have a 
creative industry strategy because it's incredibly important to their country. And the words on the right explain some of the ways they see it as being a connector between lots of different areas. Um, it's also for them a dynamic economic driver and a driver of innovation per se. And so some of the ways this is done is um, there's four strategies they've put in place that do look at how creative industries can catalyze innovation um, and how um, they can develop the reputation of the country as a place for innovation through the vehicle of creativity. United Kingdom, just switching tack for some context, um, and in my paper there's other countries mentioned like UAE, where I'm based. Um, the creative industries contributes this much money, which is about $100 million, $100 billion to the UK economy. So it's incredibly important to their um, gross domestic product, not just from a kind of export and import point of view, but from job creation. Um, it's 2.9 million jobs and 10% of all jobs in the UK. And this idea of export is very important to the UK because it's a massive way that people perceive the country in terms of commissioning creative work, coming there for interesting new ways to look at things and for the export of their TV shows like Games of Thrones, for example. And this is all built into the strategy of how they um, promote creativity. So bringing it back to design, which is my subject area, I'm an architect by trade. Um, I've migrated into a broader world of design. Um, for the UK, this link between creativity and innovation is technology, but it's also design. Um, so design does change lives. We just need to look at how we open um, tins to look at how design can help make things better. Um, but it also changes lives on many other ways to do with before and after experiences that we go through. So before and after phones, if we can imagine that, newspapers how we read them. And this idea of products, services, and experience is driven by design as the kind of touch point for how people access things like, in this case, Apple. Yes, it is about innovation. Yes, it's about technology. But it's also about how you get the kind of loyalty, the behavior within that, that gets people queuing up outside your store um, for 24 hours beforehand, and how you use all kinds of uh, retail spaces to exemplify what your brand stands for, what it means to people, whether it's marketing, innovation, design, technology, um, and how people get excited about it. So Thomas Watson back at, from IBM just said this seminal thing, which was that good design is good business, but it also makes the world a better place. And in terms of the UK, I come back to this design as a link between creativity and innovation because in 2005 there was a very seminal report commissioned by the UK government and in that the description from Sir George Cox was that creativity is the generation of new ideas. Innovation is the exploitation of ideas which connects to the financial value which was mentioned in the first talk. And design is what links innovation and creativity because you need something to touch if you're going to sell it. So it's the idea of creating attractive and valuable, or attractive value propositions for users and customers. So creativity is great but you need to turn it into tangible products and services because with innovation especially, you need something for people to access in order to touch innovation. Um, this is also happening in India, so looking at creativity design and how design is becoming more important in terms of industrial policies in countries. Um, India has recognized the value of design and the value add of design and innovation, and that's built into um, their national design policy, which they're in the process of rolling out. And it's very heavily connected to industrial policy through all these different ways, which include education, integration of tradition and technology, bringing in culture and craft, as well as forward thinking kind of service economy types of innovation and technology. Um, and and the bottom line is a lot of it's about service quality improvement um, and how to develop the design profession in India. Looking at the UK, um, they've built in design skills as being at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and of course they do have technology strategies and innovation strategies but they're now realizing the importance of design in this because it is about um, the growth of innovation and jobs. So, 
to take a slightly different track now, um, that's the importance of the connection between design, innovation and creativity to national economies. But within companies, um, it's being used right now as a catalyst for company-wide innovation. And I think this is particularly of interest to this audience. So um, design is being kind of positioned through things like design thinking as a creative problem solving process. And a lot of the ways this is happening is taking a very human centric approach to how we develop new products, services and experiences. So the idea of this is that yes, we do need technology, but how do people actually engage with the world around them and how can products and services be developed in a way that make that better or bring out certain behaviours um, or make technology more human as such and make it meaningful. And this idea of human-centred design is about um, putting the people at the centre of processes so that we have a balance between the yellow circle which is about desirability, what's good for people, on the blue circle what's feasible from a technology point of view, can we build this? And on the red circle is it viable, can we make a profit out of this? Because if you're a business, whatever you're doing has to make a profit. Um, so it's this kind of balance is where putting people at the center means that we can often design for users instead of um, design with users, not for them. So by putting people at the center, you can start to work around that. Um, and where this fits with innovation is that design is right now a very popular catalyst for innovation because of this human-centric way to look at um, our engagement with the world. Um, so I think I'll... And one of the main drivers for investing in this process is that companies want radical innovation. Um, so if we think of the world before iPhones or before smartphones um, and the world after, that these radical innovations are rarely driven by market demand. So one of the useful things about looking at design as being customer centric is that you're getting at kind of human needs and how new ways of doing things can emerge from that. So in 2007, the Apple iPhone was reviewed as being a cell phone with an MP3 player, how things have changed. Um, so moving on, I'll try and wrap up a bit. Um, Danish State Railways is using design as a catalyst for company-wide innovation by using an internal design vision lab to look at different themes like how to make trains easier for customers to use and then developing these human-centric scenarios around real people. Five minutes? Oh, okay. Okay, good. That's all right. Um, developing stories, you might say, around real people and seeing how can the service be made better for all these different types of people, no matter what age they are, what their different daily lives are like. And of course, technology is part of this, but it's about how to make it live in parallel with the people that we're um, designing around. And four. So these storyboards are used as catalysts for not the designers, but to go around the whole company, for example, the conductors, and say, here's a journey of an example person who's 80 years old. Um, how do you think we could improve the service? So yes, it's including users in the process, but also many different stakeholders within the company that may not feel that they have anything to contribute to design. So this is designed as a kind of vehicle for facilitating um, ideas and innovation to be integrated. Um, so getting kind of back to the entrepreneurial world, you can probably imagine that that's helping people think more creatively across whole companies. Um, so this idea of design as a catalyst for new ways to thinking fits beautifully with the idea of entrepreneurial thinking because right now there's, a, there's like an appropriation or reappropriation of design tools and methods to be used to, be stimulate, to stimulate different ways of thinking. So this is a, a quite a famous model called the double diamond, which is a classic design process, in fact, for most of design, um, about having different stages where you go from um, discovery stage through to some kind of end solution and what all the different processes to get there are. The double diamond meaning we converge and diverge at different times in thinking. So this idea of design thinking, which, is a five, four, which in this case is a five-step process, is it the reason it's so popular now is it's unlocking entrepreneurial thinking across companies. So it's kind of gone beyond design into how can we unlock everybody in an organization to become more innovative in how they think.
Um, so it's helping entrepreneurs and managers think about user-centered products and services, user-centered design. It's using design tools to look at what is desirable, and also it's looking at more sustainable business models, what's going to work, what is viable as well as feasible. Because innovation doesn't just happen, it requires people, not just technology, not just patents. And this idea of um, people being involved is very much around the idea of culture change. Um, some companies have innovation experts, other companies embed innovation processes throughout the whole company, so everyone can contribute um, to that. And coming back to kind of some of the country and company strategies and agendas for this, in India's design policy, one of the things they're doing is launching innovation hubs and design centers and places where people can go to do craft startup because all of these things do connect back to how we live as well as connecting to technology, how we build. Um, and on the right, BMW has launched innovation labs in the United Kingdom, not just for developing entrepreneurs, people who think differently, people who have new ideas, but also entrepreneurs, and it's getting people in their own company to think more creatively as a kind of core capability um, that BMW can, I, know, I guess, get everyone to think more, think differently. So what does this have to do with design management? Um, if you manage the ways in which you engage design in and with organizations, you can make a lot of money. So this is standard in Poor's um, top 500, or, um, 500. And the companies that place design at the center of what they do um, increase their um, financial return on investment. And in terms of um, design management, so on the, on the right, we have you know, innovation, which is the holy grail, and why we're doing a lot of what we do. In the middle, um, from a design point of view, or how we get about achieving innovation. So for design, it's about design thinking, design sprints, the double diamond process that I showed you, using different methods outside of design in order to achieve innovation. So design-driven innovation, you might say. But design management is very much part of the result side. How can you guarantee return on investment? So just like innovation needs innovation management, design needs design management as well. Um, and it is this idea of creating value by design and guaranteeing return on investment. So looking at um, how putting people at the center of these processes, um, there are ways to support this culture of creativity that link all of these different areas together um, because it's uh, it's, it's about supporting a culture of creativity, building structure into organizations to deliver on that, but also looking at um, different stories and experiences that people will love enough to buy the products and services and experience and technologies and innovations that we're putting out there. So um, some aspects of design management are looking at how to tell different stories about design capability, the connection between creativity and business, for example. Um, and on the right, this is a very famous ladder called the Danish design ladder. Um, and it's looking at four different ways that companies can use design, right through from no design, through to design is form giving, design is process, and then design is strategy. And on the right hand side, it's just demonstrating, taking the outer circle, that the contribution of design to the wider economic um, growth of countries and sectors. Some of the other stories to tell about design that, you know, is part of how you manage design and how you tell people what it can do and what it is, is um, on the left, this idea that um, design thinking certainly right now is being used to bring more clarity to complex problems that don't seem to have any solution at all. And that's just because of some of the tools that they work with. For example, including many people in a process and shouting it out. Um, so this idea of going from uncertainty and wicked problems into clarity and fo clarity is one way to talk about it. Another way on the right is much more kind of staged process with very definite tools which may work a lot better for a more kind of business or management mindset that needs to see how the structures fit in as opposed to the chaos of the first one, which most designers know about. So just to give you a tangible example, in Japan, the patent office is um, 
looking at the idea of competitive advantage by design. Um, and so they're adopting an, a kind of a philosophy of design-driven management. So what they acknowledge is that design is part of branding. It's how corporate companies express themselves as well as national identities. But design for innovation is a key growth area um, for how even more innovation can be stimulated in Japan. Um, so design-driven management is a management approach whereby a company leverages design as a primary driver of competitiveness through greater brand power and innovation capability. Um, and how they're also doing this in terms of expanding the scope of design is looking at the fourth industrial revolution and asking, well, how did we used to think about design in the industrial era? This fits very well with some of the slides from the opening sessions. Um, and what is the evolution of the definition of design into the idea of designing businesses themselves and right through to design engineering, um, which down the bottom right, all they're really doing is taking design as a metaphor, but also as um, a way to drive innovation as a starting point and a way to bring everything together um, and looking at the major touch points. Um, so part of this is also an evolution of the uh, tools of design being used to move from customer experience and user-centered design and new ideas for um, innovation into this idea of human experience. So some of the debates right now, certainly in the United States, are about how design is no longer about making things pretty or good, although it is still that, but it's gone beyond that into solving problems for humanity. And this particular process it uses um, is kind of hence the popularity of it as a catalyst for innovation. Um, so what you've just seen, what I've just tried to show you is that design is a resource that can be managed. It is connected to branding and promoting your product, but it's also a process for innovation, for facilitation of how you unlock new ideas within companies, um, and it's also a process for cultural transformation. And the final goal, I guess, is about creating a culture of creativity, enterprise, and entrepreneurship for, for, by design. So the purpose of today was purely for inspiration on thinking about the kind of human element um, in technology and innovation, um, and to not take this as gospel, but to look at how um, it might change how you talk about things in your everyday lives to do with innovation and technology. OK, thank you. Thank you. So I've written a few books in design management, and they're in about 16 languages. And within the body of research for that are examples of small to medium enterprises as well as big companies. And the biggest lesson to look at is um, what, what, what do they want to achieve? Um, what are they ready for? And that's a culture question. Where do they create and how do they do that? So for example, do they want external consultants that can help them stimulate creativity? Or do they want to hire and create and invest in creating positions for people that are going to grow that for them? Um, so you, you're probably familiar with the Design Council work, but they've been spending years looking at toolkits to help small to medium enterprises become more creative, not for creativity's sake, but as a stimulus for innovation, gross domestic product, export, um, the kind of cultural reputation of the UK as being a creative centre. So um, I would refer you back to the Design Council website for specific numbers on all that. But in terms of the work I've done, I, I, when I write books, I research them at the time to look at um, best practice case studies for who is doing the best work out there. So I tend not to look for um, you know, what is, for example, a good design management case study. I look at who's achieving remarkable success. And then I go back from that and look at how was that achieved. So that's one. I would find a company that you are really, that you admire, and then go back and look at how did they achieve that. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Islam Abu Hila. I'm uh, the head of the Civil and Architectural Engineering Department uh, at Applied Science University um, in partnership with uh, London South Bank University. Uh, my co-author for this paper is uh, Mr. Noon. Would you like to introduce yourself, Mr. Noon? Good afternoon. My name is Noel Laban. I'm with Applied Science University. I'm the director of the foundation year, which we are heavily involved with Cardiff Metropolitan University and London South Bank University. Thank you very much, Noel. I'd like to thank you all for coming to this uh, presentation. Uh, I would also like to thank especially our students who are in the back, uh, especially the engineering students who came. Um, the, the topic which I'm going to uh, discuss today, or 
uh, present to you is about uh, future architecture in science fiction films. We all, I think, share uh, interest in, in, in films, in movies, especially science fiction films. So, first of all, let me give you a little bit of a background about the relationship between film and the future city. I would argue that film acts as a laboratory for the exploration of the built environment. Also, films became a useful instrument for understanding and critiquing the backdrops of the metropolitan city and its future. All the visions can be experimented through science fiction films. Films help to uh, define the concept of the city of the present by examining the role it has played in the past and expected position in the future. And obviously, we have the people who would watch these films who give us feedback about their expectations for future cities and its architecture. Uh, talking into more details about architecture and the role played by architecture for film and film for architecture, it can be argued that architecture is used as a communication tool through which directors and filmmakers send certain messages. And architecture gives the film its believability, setting the mood, character, time and place for action. Also, architecture plays an important role as a good signifier, signifying different aspects of the, of the society. On the other hand, when we talk about the role played by film for architecture, film provides architecture with an outlet for realizing visions that can never exist and entreats experiences that in reality has not occurred. Also, in the medium of film, architects can create architecture without worrying about many constraints in some uh, cases, cinema architecture is an ideal fulfillment of what architecture can be about in terms of sending visual messages. The scope of this study is to look at the city and its architecture in the future through a series of science fiction films in the 20th century. Uh, this is part of a bigger study and in this uh, study we looked at Metropolis which was produced in 1927. Just imagine Blade Runner, the Batman series, the Star Wars series, the Fifth Element and Equilibrium. These are the movies or the films which we looked at uh, and we looked at the, the notion of the skyscrapers in these films. So when we look at these science fiction films we would notice that the future is either a utopic or a dystopic future. For the utopic future, or the, the films which portray the future as a utopia, we would find that it's mostly a clean, technological, transparent, a lot of glasses being used. Skyscrapers is dominating the skyline of the city. Lots of billboards covering the facades of the buildings. We would see flying vehicles, modern architecture is dominant, and large corporations are dominating the skyline of the city. As for the dystopic visions of the future, it's almost dark, deprived of natural resources. Again, the skyscrapers are dominating the skyline of uh, the city. It's polluted and has reference to old architectural styles. Um, in, in this study, uh, I'll try, if there is time, I'll try to focus on these four films, four science fiction films. So for example, when we talk about Metropolis or we see the architecture in Metropolis, we would find that, first of all, the main theme about Metropolis for the people who haven't seen it. Uh, film of Metropolis de deals mainly with the idea of class struggle, uh, relying heavily on rich set design, presenting this struggle through altitude of buildings. So when we look at the architecture, which we can see on the right-hand side here, we will find that the city is dominated by skyscrapers. There is a multi-level transportation systems and there is many forms and influences such as Bauhaus, Art Deco, Gothic Expressionists, and the New York skyscrapers. Large geometric forces, as we can see, are dominating the buildings. And the buildings are exact and pure with repeated matrices of elements and incredible heights. The motives and significances of these used architectural elements, as a whole, the film serves to reflect Fritz Lang's uh, vision. By the way, Fritz Lang was an architect as well. Uh, he is the director of the film. So it reflects his vision of a technologically dependent society. Also, he was affected by the New York skyscrapers. The multi-level transportation system signifies the tremendous development in technology. When we look at the significance of the transportation system, it gives us a message or tells us a message about the technological development in that society. 
The different forms signifies differences between people, social difference. Large geometric force shows who are in control and who are less dominant within the society. And the exactness of the buildings revealed how practical the people of Metropolis have grown. These are some shots from uh, the, uh, the film, and we can see the uh, characteristics of the architecture within Metropolis. If we go to Blade Runner, uh, which was depicting the future of Los Angeles in 2019, this year actually, the film was produced in 1982, and the main theme of the film hypothesized that by the year of 2019, Los Angeles will be a city that, that supports a population of over 90 million, only the city of Los Angeles. The colonization of the elite to utopian off-world outside Earth has resulted in the large-scale immigration of the upper class, leaving the city populated by a mainly ethnic underclass. So when we look at the architecture of the city of Los Angeles in 2019, we will find huge, huge mega structures dominating the center of the city. The bases of the buildings are sloping, covering, as we can see in this photo on the top, covering about six city blocks. The visual layering of architectural typologies from various cultural past create a post-modern image. Also, the coexistence of new huge mega structures with old skyscrapers. When we talk about the motives and the significances, we, it's better to uh, read what Sid Mead had mentioned. He's the production designer of the set. He said that I took the two World Trade Towers in New York City and the New York Street proportions as a today model and expanded everything vertically about two and a half times. This inspired me to make the bases of the building sloping to cover about six city blocks on the premise that you need more ground access to the building mass. It's again as in the previous uh, presentation about design being uh, problem solving. So this was a problem and this was the solution to that problem. The significance of the used architectural elements within, uh, the, uh, within the film, we can say that the huge corporation building signifies a strong sense of financial power. Blade Runner, like Metropolis, reveals class structures through its uh, high architecture or vertical architecture. Also, the visual layer, layering of architectural typology signifies an image of a globalized world and a city of contradictions. The coexistence of the new and old buildings also evokes an economic significance as the removal of the old buildings begins to cost more. So it's better to retrofit the existing buildings. The film remains as a compelling reminder of just how life in the 20th, uh, 21st century may eventually become. It depicts a class separation, the growing gulf between rich and poor and the population explosion, but as such, it offered no solution. We can argue about that if this actually is existing nowadays or it did not happen. When we uh, talk about the fifth element, the main theme was that as a result of the planetary exportation of vast amounts of Earth's water reserve in order to serve distant planets, following the colonization of the solar system, the level of the oceanic water table has fallen dramatically, and this is what resulted in the vertical street canyons we see in the fifth element. So the city of its and its architecture are characterized by being sliced vertically, and the hidden infrastructure, as we can see in these photos, has started to appear and become part of uh, the city, but the old monuments still exist within the city which is the city of New York, but there is no ground level which can be noticed within the sets of the film. The high-rise buildings with the domination of large corporation buildings are one of the main features in the film, and the public transportation, such as the metros and the trains, are incorporated within the facades of the buildings. Uh, Mainly, the significance is an economic, so that the economic logic is the motive behind slicing the island uh, vertically, and the revealed infrastructure signifies that an environmental catastrophe has happened, which led to the uh, image which we can see in that film. And architecture in the film signifies the powerful capitalist state, the Tower of Zork, which was in uh, the previous slide, we can see it in the next slide, is the highest building within uh, the skyline of uh, the city. Also, the role of the altitude of the building, again, signifies a functional motive for building skyscrapers, which is the physical constraint of the land. After all, New York is a, an island. 
Also, the multi-layering of the transportation system reveals development in technology and overpopulation within the city. These are some of the uh, snapshots from the film. We can see how the billboards are covering uh, the facades of the building and how the city itself has been uh, uh, has been uh, divided into vertical uh, canyons. When it comes to equilibrium, the main theme of equilibrium is that it presents a vision of the world at peace, but with a tremendous human cost. The main problem, which is uh, envisioned by the ruler of that country, is, are the feelings. So he decided to uh, remove the feelings, and anybody who would be feeling, that he would be committing a crime. So the architecture which reflects this state for the people of uh, Libya, uh, we can see that the buildings are faceless, the large billboards are covering the facades of the buildings, but now it's not uh, for commercials, it's for uh, airing the propaganda of the ruler. I'll try to go quickly so that we keep in time. And the significance of the architecture used is that the color, which is related to the first presentation, is used to evoke feelings. So when we look at the architecture for the people, we will find that it's monochromatic. While when we go to the spaces of the ruler, we can see some classical styles and the colors are being used, although using a color would be considered as a crime within Libya. We can see here the difference uh, between uh, the two set designs. So. If we look at these films, we can find that there are specific signifiers which has been repeated in these films. The classical style has been used as a signifier. The modern style, the skyscrapers, the billboards, transportation system, the monumental scale, and the intimate scale. And most of these signified some ecological aspects, economical aspects, political aspects, psychological and sociological aspects, also technological aspects were there. We will find that these three signifiers are linked to each other and repeatedly used in these films. When we compare between the implemented signifiers in the reviewed films, we will find that the modern style, the skyscraper and the monumental scale are the mostly used signifiers within these films. When we see the significances of modern style, we will find that it's mostly having sociological significances. As for the monumental scale, its significance is political and sociological as well. When we talk about the skyscraper, when we observe the skyscraper, it's mostly a sociological significance. The associations, these are the closing remarks, the associations between the skyscrapers in the reviewed films is that they signify the class division, the difference between the poor and the rich, a signifier of the social status of the inhabitants. It represents modern at and futuristic approaches. It signifies a sense of entrapment and imprisonment in some of the films that was uh, heavily uh, introduced in a film called Brazil. And it's used to enforce control and manipulation uh, mostly utopic, skyscrapers are mostly utopic, even within a dystopic context, since it reflects a historical stage in the life of the city. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, there is a sample, actually, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, that it's, it's part of a bigger research. I'm more than happy to share it with you, uh, Dr. Abdem, after uh, the conference, where uh, all the methodology for getting these uh, samples and getting these percentages are uh, in full details in that. Yes, uh, in, these, in this study, uh, the focus are on the uh, significances of these architectural elements which have been used. So there is an analysis of these social aspects and how these signifiers uh, are interpreted as having social significances or political significances. Yes, they, they were used uh, with like different significances. Uh, for example, in, in, in some cases, they were used to show uh, the, uh, the people who are dominating the city, the people who are ruling the city, such as in the case of uh, Metropolis. Uh, in other cases, uh, they had uh, uh, some political aspects where uh, the, the, the government is are placed in these large uh, scale forms or large uh, geometric forms. Yes, it was based mainly on, on, lit on literature review and reviewing the literature and uh, the, uh, the articles were, which was published on that topic, uh, mainly uh, by researchers in the field and by filmmakers, uh, production designers, and some interviews with directors as well. 
Well, that's a very good question, uh, Dr. Ramzi, because when we look at these films, which were predicting the future, which is now, it's, it would be very useful to go and see whether or not these predictions have happened now. So uh, a film like Metropolis, which is predicting 2020-something, and it was produced in 1927, it would be very interesting to, to say that the, uh, the vision of the multi-layering, for example, of the transportation system did not happen in Berlin, for example, or in Germany, but you might find it in other countries. Like I, I personally, I would say that in my country, I come from Egypt, we are adopting in my neighborhood an approach of building so many bridges and so many layerings and things like that, and people who are um, like scholars in terms of urban planning and town planning are like objecting against things like this. Um, other visions, for example, like let's go back to Metropolis as well. Most of the critics and most of the uh, filmmakers were considering it as an alarm for the people. If we uh, uh, relied heavily on the industrial revolution, this would be the dystopic future which we'd be suffering from in the future which did not happen uh, in, in, in many of the uh, Western countries. Uh, when we talk about the, the future and how it's going to look like, judging on the previous visions, which many of them did not happen actually, um, you, ca you could never say that uh, these visions which are uh, presented to us in these science fiction films might happen in the future. Honestly, in my personal opinion, I can't say that uh, this vision is more likely to happen in the future based on the study on the previous visions which did not happen. Some parts might happen, but not all of it, not like the holistic vision of the future city. Like, like the example which I've just given right now about this multi-layering of the transportation system, this, like the, uh, let's say, that for example, the, uh, it, 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 it takes us back to uh, the question of how scientific are science fiction films? Like these visions, are they really based on science? Some of them, they are based on science and they go and make proper research to come with a credible future and some of them uh, are not. At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a movie, it's a film. Yeah, so uh, some, some of it will be realistic. Uh, part of it might not be realistic. It depends on how much research has been put in creating this vision for the future. Exactly, so, some of them, yeah. And, well, when it comes to the uh, class division, the gap between the rich and the poor, all these kind of things, yes, <laughs> we can see it happening. It, it, it might not be, be uh, that visually explicit, but it is there. It is there, uh, and we can see it in many communities. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Because, yeah, yeah, this one, Dr. Uh, what they call this, Pip Lor. Good afternoon, everybody. So my presentation is under the title Innovative Field Application of Fiber Reinforced Polymer Composite Parts in Civil Engineering Infrastructure. First, I would like to thank you for uh, attending my presentation. Uh, my name is Hamdi Mohammed, Associate Professor at the Department of Civil and Construction Engineering Applied Science University. Uh, so my presentation, I will go, this is a table of content with the presentation. I will start with a brief introduction about the topic, then talking about the development and properties of FRB bars. Then uh, I will talk uh, in short summary about the specification and design codes. Then very quickly about the field application and at the end the concluding remark. So first I would like to ask what, it, what does it mean by the technology from forced concrete? So the technology from forced concrete is the material that we are using every day to build our infrastructure. So we are using the concrete with the reinforced steel bars to build the tunnels, the bridges, building, commercial building, uh, everywhere. So we are building the uh, structure and the infrastructure uh, using the concrete with the steel reinforcement. Unfortunately, this uh, concrete technology uh, has facing uh, a degradation problem due to the corrosion of steel reinforcement. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, hundreds of dollars, billions of dollars, a million of dollars, it's required to replace the deteriorated structure everywhere in the world. Just only in the United States, 300 uh, billion, it's required to replace the deteriorated structures. Unfortunately, uh, during the last two decades, 
there is a different uh, solution has been proposed to replace the steel reinforcement, starting from using a box steel and galvanized steel, stainless steel. However, the result of this replacement has been disappointed due to the it was uh, less effective or cost prohibitive. Nowadays, using the fiber enforced polymer composite bar, it has been proved to be a, a solution for this problem to replace the steel enforcement in everywhere in the structure that it faced uh, a problem due to the corrosion of steel enforcement. So this material actually it's, uh, it's composed from two mo main components. The fiber, which can be glass or basalt or uh, carbon, and the uh, polymer matrix that like epoxy coated. Uh, why we are using this material? Because it's durable, non-corrosive material. It's lightweight and it has higher strength than, than the steel reinforcement. This is how it looks, these bars, uh, straight bars that uh, we have carbon, glass. Uh, we, since two, uh, two decades, they started to fabricate these as straight bars. And nowadays, actually, with the innovation and the technology, we are able to fabricate these uh, materials with spirals, uh, uh, circular or squares. Why? To be able to build uh, cages in different configuration, circular or square to reinforce the bridges or the uh, any structure. So different configuration for reinforce it. To design the structure with this material, with this uh, innovative material, so we have to uh, follow the standard and document and design guidelines. And nowadays, actually, over the world, we have different standards that it was developed considering the uh, research, research and development. We have in the United States document to design the building and the bridges, and Europe also in J Japan and Australia. Uh, this is an example for the document that we have in the world in Canada and the United States to design the uh, Canadian uh, Standard Association S6 to design the bridges with this material. And also we have the uh, Canadian S8 uh, 06 to design building with the fiber reinforced polymers bars. In the United States, we have the SI440 to design building and the H2 to design the bridges. This is, and also we have uh, some documents actually to have specification and delimitation to produce these materials. So this is the Canadian and the SI American standards to, uh, uh, to give some specification and limits how these materials should be fabricated. And this document to design the uh, bridges and the structures. Uh, nowadays, we have three grades for these materials. A grade I with the youngest models uh, over 40, and grade two uh, with the youngest models over 50 MB, uh, G, gigapascal, and the grade three over 60 GBA. And these uh, are some of the properties that we have to consider in the producing this material, like the uh, void content. Uh, water absorption, cure ratio, glass transition, temperature, and so on. Uh, where we can use this bar, uh, we have we can use this bar everywhere that we have problem with the corrosion of steel reinforcement in the bridges, in the marine structures, in the tunnels, uh, in the MRI rooms, in the hospitals. So anywhere that we have problem with the steel. Uh, Reinforcement or the corrosion of reinforcement, so we can use this. We can use these innovative uh, bars. Over the last ten uh, years, actually, this bar tool has been used uh, successfully in in Canada, and the United States, and other countries to build uh, hundreds of bridges. This is the first bridge that it was built in Canada in 1997 uh, in Sherbrooke. And this it was uh, the second bridge that was built in the world in 2001. Also, it was built in Canada. And the third bridge in, in the world was built in the United States uh, in 2002. And then the fourth bridge it was, uh, this is also the third uh, bridge. And then the fourth bridge was in 2004 in Canada. They used the bars mainly in the deck slab and the barrier for to reinforce the uh, concrete bridges. 
Uh, at the time, they started to monitor and to instrument this part uh, during the surface life to check the performance of this part with the uh, loads and the uh, traffic. They measure the deflection and the cracks for several bridges, and the result indicates, it was indicated that there is no any problem with using this material in different structure. And after actually there is 100 bridges that was built uh, using this material across Canada, United States, and Europe. And these some examples of the bridges that across Canada in Edmonton, uh, they are using the uh, bars also in the deck slab of the bridges. And this is uh, an example using the FRB bars in the precast deck slabs. Other uh, application is in uh, across Canada, Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta, British Columbia. And this is actually uh, the first cable bridge that it was designed with such this material. It, this uh, bridge was designed in 2012. I have a good chance to uh, participate in design this bridge. Uh, the FRB bar was used in the uh, fabricating and designing the uh, deck slab with the bridge. The bridge itself, the, the, it, it has three central, it's, uh, three central beers. The first, the uh, height of the beer, 252 meters. The span of the bridge is 250 meters. And the width of the bridge, uh, 36 meters. In this bridge, they, they used innovative material like precast panels, high performance concrete, GFRB rebars instead of the stainless steel rebars, joined between panels filled with ultra high performance uh, fiber reinforced polymer concrete. And the bridge was designed to, for a surface life over 100 years instead of 50 years of the, uh, when you are using steel bars. Uh, we designed the bridge considering the highway bridge design codes. And here are some photos showing the construction of the bridge. They, they are used uh, precast uh, concrete panels to build the uh, deck of the uh, bridge. And this is during the construction of the bridge. And this is how it looks before to open the bridge for the traffic. The bridge was open in 2000. Uh, 17. Uh, one of the other problem actually we are facing using the steel reinforcement in the parking garage due to the uh, salts and the uh, which cause the, the corrosion of steel reinforcement. So the first bridge, the first parking garage that was designed and built using this uh, innovative material, 2014 in Canada also, and there is uh, other uh, parking garage also it was built using this materials. Other innovative application of this type, uh, kind of material in the water treatment plant in the uh, correlation tank. This tank also I, uh, I have a good chance to participate in design it. So this is showing the raft foundation using this uh, materials and the, all the structure and this is how it looks the tank after finishing the uh, construction. Other application in the insulator uh, which uh, also it faced a, a huge problem due to the corrosion steel reinforcement. Also, we use this material to reinforce the uh, pavement, highway, uh, roads, uh, highway, uh, roads in the uh, reinforcement pavement. And the recent application, we are using this material to reinforce the concrete sleepers. So, Finally, we can say that the, uh, using this material in the structure that we, it's facing the corrosion of the steel reinforcement presents a great solution to uh, the corrosion of steel reinforcement. Questions? Yeah, according to the Young's models, we have like in Canada, we have three grades. According to the Young's models, yeah. Uh, first question, answering the first question, the, you know, like steel bars, we are able to bend it at the side. Okay, starting from small uh, diameter bars until to reach like 25 millimeter diameter. 
Yeah, sure. With the high, uh, high tensile models, uh, steel bars is different from milled steel bar to bend it. But usually for this kind of material, we are not able to, build, to uh, bend it at the side. It should be fabricated because it's fabricated using protrusion method. Okay, so it should be uh, bended at the manufacturer. So we are not able to bend it at the side. So we can bend any, any grade, any diameter, but it should be designed and fabricated at the manufacturer. Like yes, it should be produced bended, yeah. Uh, the second question for ultra high performance concrete, this, you know, it's uh, a kind of material that we are using different admixture in the, to mix the concrete, so we can have uh, higher strength, a higher workability, like okay. Yes, like silver before, yeah. We have issue with the steel, you know, in the uh, aggressive environment. So we have issue with this material actually uh, in the fire and the alkaline solution. Uh, you know, so with the codes and with the design guidelines and with the research, you know, we are able to solve this problem. In terms, we can increase the cover of the concrete. So we can increase the endurance of the fire. Uh, but still uh, a problem for this material, the fire. And for the, some of application like the bridges, the fire is not an issue. Uh, you know, our, this, our material or the FRB material was mainly used for the Dix lab, but the cable itself, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but it's uh, cell, uh, steel, cables, steel cables. Yeah, uh, it depends on the member that it's exposed to the, uh, you know, the, the Dix lab, it's usual in, during the winter, it's exposed to snow, so they have to spread salt. So the Dix lab itself, you know, it's the main member that exposed it directly to the uh, harsh environment. Yeah, in, in Bahrain and Gulf, in uh, country, actually, it's a good environment. Why? Because we have the uh, uh, salt water, we have the uh, uh, saline water, so it's also this material is good to uh, prevent any corrosion of the steel. Yeah, the transition temperature for this material is about around 100 Celsius. So there is no issue for this country to uh, have it. Uh, with uh, such uh, temperature. Uh, curing the con concrete with steel or FRB, it will not be changed. You know, the, using the material, the reinforcement material itself, it will not affect the curing uh, method or the process of the curing. So this material will not have any effect on the curing uh, process. So we can use the normal curing uh, process that we are using for any structure. Uh, before I start, usually uh, the students uh, present on behalf of the lecturer, but today the lecturer is present on behalf of the student. Uh, so this is uh, my student, uh, my master student's paper. Uh, it's taken from the, the thesis of the, the student, a master uh, thesis. Uh, it's very short uh, presentation, uh, very short uh, uh, topic. Uh, the role of managerial innovation in improving uh, the human resource performance. Uh, the sector uh, quite different from the other uh, sectors, which is in, uh, in the sport uh, sector. So uh, we take uh, one of the variable, which is uh, the managerial innovation. So we, we, uh, we try to I mean to test uh, this variable, uh, how it's uh, related to the uh, performance and how it uh, can be uh, effect or um, impact the, uh, the employees or the human resource in, in, in this sector, exactly in the sport, um, in Bahrain Sport Federation. Uh, this is related to the uh, employees who are um, um, as working as admin, administrative uh, uh, um, please there. Uh, so, as you know, a lot of uh, organization, they are facing our, uh, one issue or one challenge, which is uh, how they can uh, uh, improve their employees uh, or their human resource. Um, uh, in, in their organization. So there is a lot of uh, factors, uh, but based on, on the uh, research, method, based on the literature review, and based on the past studies, we found that uh, uh, what's called the managerial innovation could be uh, effect 
the human resource uh, performance in, in the Bahraini uh, sport, please. Um, so, and based on the uh, vision and uh, aspiration of the Kingdom of Bahrain, so which is looking how they can uh, improve the human uh, resource performance in, in different sectors. And this is one of, of them, uh, the Federation of the Sport. Uh, and as you know now, uh, the innovation uh, is one of the factors that could be, uh, as I said before, affect uh, the performance of the human resource. So uh, that's why the, now the, uh, the competition between organization or among organizations is not uh, in, in the technology uh, or on other. It's nowadays, it's based on the literature, it's uh, based in, in a human resource, how they can, I mean, compete with each other with uh, uh, the human resource. Uh, and this is the problem statement in, in, in the research, which is uh, as one of the biggest challenges, as I said, in the public sector is how to improve the human resource performance and how to um, uh, can uh, fill the gap which is between the human resource performance and the other, which is uh, the organization nowadays, they are looking uh, uh, more not just to the performance itself, how they can, I mean, enhance or improve the performance of the, the human resource in their organization. And uh, if you look at the sport uh, sector, is one of the sector uh, which is uh, uh, in Bahrain, which is given uh, uh, attention uh, from the leaders and from the managers in, in, uh, um, in that sector. So uh, the attention is uh, in the human uh, resource performance, so how they can improve the performance uh, in, in, uh, in that sector. And, uh, and it's clear that uh, uh, little studies conducted in, in uh, uh, not in human, in human resource performance, but in, in, in taking the sport uh, federation uh, sector. And it was necessary, this research, to address, uh, um, uh, as I said, the affluence of elements. Uh, uh, and in, in the managerial and communication, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, in managerial innovation, we uh, have taken three dimensions, uh, which is the, uh, one of them, the uh, fluency and uh, originality and uh, um, the other one uh, uh, of, of the dimension. And this is the framework of the research. We have IV and the DV, and the IV is the manager innovation, and we have three uh, dimensions. And this is the main uh, DV. And uh, the framework uh, of the research is built based on uh, the literature and based on the gaps in the past studies. Uh, and if we uh, look to the methodology, uh, we have used uh, a quantitative approach uh, on um, 170 of, of the uh, employees, of the administrative employees in, in, in that sector. And uh, the response rate was uh, 93, which is um, a very high uh, response rate. And this is the correlation um, result. Uh, which is talking that there is uh, uh, a relationship and there is what's called uh, uh, a relationship between the IVs uh, and uh, uh, DV, as you see in the in, in, uh, uh, table. And here it's the uh, regression analysis, which is showing that uh, the IV, which is the managerial innovation, uh, with the dimension is related and can be uh, influence the human resource uh, performance based on the result. If you look at the R square, which is uh, means 31, which is accepted and it's a, a good, but means there is other uh, uh, 
uh, variables could be affect the human resource uh, uh, performance. And this is the discussion, which is means uh, discussion based on the result, which is mean there is a positive statistical uh, significant influence of managerial innovation on human resource in at Bahrain Sport uh, Federation. And it's clear there is a positive and statistically significant uh, relationship between uh, the dimensions of managerial communication, uh, uh, managerial innovation on, on uh, the human uh, resource performance. And the result is consistent with the previous studies, such uh, uh, project 2006, which is uh, showing that uh, um, the manager working in, at, in the ministries of uh, Gaza, which is, uh, uh, they have uh, influence uh, uh, the dimensions of managerial information on uh, human resource uh, uh, performance. And uh, to conclude, uh, uh, um, uh, this presentation is, uh, as uh, mentioned before, that uh, there is a relationship between the managerial uh, uh, innovation uh, uh, related to the human resource performance and means that the uh, sport federation at Bahrain should uh, give attention uh, to the managerial uh, innovation which is, can be affect uh, uh, or influence the human resource uh, performance at uh, uh, that sector. Um, that's it for the uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Bismillah uh, rahim Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good evening uh, everybody. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I want to introduce first myself. Uh, I am uh, Ahmed Khalaf Mutar al Muhammadi, uh, an assistant professor in uh, business uh, administration department at uh, ASU. Actually, today I'm going to present uh, uh, the part of my uh, master student thesis, which is the relationship uh, between entrepreneur leadership and job satisfaction, a study of uh, SMEs uh, in Kingdom of uh, Bahrain. This is the content of uh, uh, our presentation, uh, introduction and literature review, study model, hypothesis, method, conclusion, recommendation, and uh, references. Introduction. Uh, as you know, uh, now there are rapid changes in uh, economic and technology, uh, and even the wallets yeah, and lead most of countries to uh, focus on uh, their uh, economic. Therefore, the development of uh, the SMEs in Bahrain uh, uh, became the central and most powerful element for uh, 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 to, uh, most powerful in line with the uh, economic vision of uh, Bahrain. Uh, therefore, the uh, Kingdom of Bahrain is the yani, honor and uh, uh, flexible, uh, established more flexible and dynamic economic. Uh, in this area of the relationship uh, between job satisfaction and uh, entrepreneurship, actually uh, my master twin found the gap. There is only few uh, studies on the relationship between jobs at uh, entrepreneur leadership and job satisfaction. And also the subject of entrepreneur uh, leadership is the combine between uh, uh, entrepreneur and uh, leadership. So uh, we found the, the theoretical uh, gap and especially in the Arab uh, research. Therefore this study aims to examine and investigate the relationship between entrepreneurial leadership and job satisfaction in Bahraini SMEs. This is a literature view. We have the definition of entrepreneurial leadership as mentioned uh, before. It's combined between uh, entrepreneur and uh, leadership and uh, uh, in scope of a strategic vision uh, and uh, risk taking, uh, innovation. Now, and job satisfaction is uh, defined as 
يعني feeling and some of the people and individuals about their job experiencing and intrinsic. Okay. According to Altaid 2015, uh, is only the actually the one study that my master student when she searched the literature found this uh, case the relationship between the two variables of the study. So uh, the result of that study they found there is a, a, a significant relationship. Uh, also we found يعني, uh, limited studies and especially in Arab uh, context. Therefore, the present study attempted to overcome the gap by probing into the relationship between uh, entrepreneurial leadership and job satisfaction. This is the model of the study. We have the entrepreneurial uh, leadership and we have the four uh, sub-variables, which is uh, autonomy and innovation, risk-taking, and strategic vision. And we have the dependent variable job satisfaction. So we have four hypotheses. We have, uh, يعني, uh, we have to examine the relationship. Uh, there is a significant relationship between the variables of entrepreneur leadership in terms of uh, autonomy, innovation, risk taking, and strategic vision on job satisfaction. The methodology of this study, the population is uh, according on the, يعني, uh, uh, when, when, when my student uh, uh, make the surveys around uh, uh, one and a half year ago, the population of the study is around 22,000 uh, 22, uh, working in uh, 169, 169 enterprises. Okay, the sample of this study, according to Margon scale, is 377. Okay, from 20 enterprises. Okay, uh, uh, the rate of response is 97%. We use also the SBSS software, version 23, and also we uh, developed the questionnaire for entrepreneur leadership with 29 items and for job satisfaction, 19 items. Also, we use the, uh, uh, the five Leckert scale. Okay, and uh, يعني, we employed the descriptive statistical approach and regression analysis. This is the sample, the method, uh, how we, we, we choose the uh, sample. Okay, we have the total of uh, يعني, uh, number of uh, factories, 169, and this is the rate of each factor from the total and we have uh, the sample is three, uh, 377. So the, uh, we choose uh, uh, يعني, by percentage for each uh, manufacturer. This, uh, uh, as, as you see here, we have all the uh, Kronbach Alpha showing the, uh, يعني, uh, in the, at the accepted level. Uh, as uh, it's uh, more than uh, point, uh, 70 according to Al Maani and other 2012. And this is the total Kronbach Alpha for all the force of variables and job satisfaction. This table shows the uh, co uh, يعني, co co correlation coefficient and also this table showing the uh, multiple regression as you see. We have significant all uh, below 0 0.05 and uh, at the significant level. And we have the most uh, affecting variable on job satisfaction is the risk taking, okay, which is uh, 0.67. And the least one is strategic uh, vision. Still have impact, but the least one. Uh, our result is agreed with uh, uh, the study that we uh, uh, based on uh, Altad 2015, which shows a significant impact of entrepreneur leadership on job satisfaction. Also, uh, previous studies 
that examined the leadership, like leadership style on job satisfaction, found also a significant relationship. Risk taking, as I mentioned in the table before, is most important factor for job satisfaction. Our result is differ with the other studies, like Al Khalifa, uh, who done his uh, study in uh, Al Kuwait, 2014. Uh, his results showed a lack of importance of risk for entrepreneurs. And also another study where risk has least impact on entrepreneur behavior. Also, the results showed that entrepreneurs empowered their subordinates in Bahraini SMT, uh, SMEs to effectively perform their uh, responsibilities. There is a little, the result showing uh, a little lack of appreciation of employees by their leaders towards their efforts uh, at the individual and team levels. Lack of motivation to support employees' innovative uh, idea. Therefore, uh, we recommend the leaders should pay more attention to the importance of, um, they empower, but they still need to give more empowerment for their uh, uh, employees. Leaders must highlight the contribution of their subordinates and their efforts and encourage their colleagues to follow their pioneering behavior rather than relying on guidance of their leaders. Okay. Encourage the employees at the levels for their new ideas at, at, at the individual and team level for their new ideas and innovative proposal. This is the references of the study. I thank you very much. Actually, this is part of my master's in the study. <laughs> Unfortunately, she did not come, and I <laughs> present instead of her. No, but I think you okay. did very well. Thank you. Yeah. Any yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. My name is uh, Hatem Damak. I am an uh, associate fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Engineering from ENIS, the National School of Engineering at Sfax from Tunisia. And uh, I'm pursuing my MBA at Strath Strathclyde University. And uh, I am from Applied Science University. Uh, today I will be presenting you a paper uh, that I submitted to the conference called can a growing support for tech startups and a flourishing entrepreneurial ecosystem make Bahrain a new regional hub? Now, uh, usually I start, especially when I present in, uh, outside of Bahrain or uh, at other venues, to a quick presentation about ASU. But as I can see, luckily, all of you were attended, uh, attended today, this morning, the uh, opening ceremony. So you are all familiar with the achievements of uh, ASU. And I would like to highlight in particular that we are a very entrepreneurial uh, university as we have achieved, uh, our students have achieved uh, uh, the first prize of Injaz Bahrain and also achieved two prizes at Injaz uh, competition in the Arab world. I'm very proud to be at the conference today uh, to submit my paper at the International Conference on Innovation, Technology, Enterprise and Entrepreneurship 2019. And let me start by a little story about how, how this uh, paper or the idea of this paper uh, uh, came uh, to me. So I came to Bahrain about three years ago in 2016. And uh, as you know, uh, your family keeps calling you. And they were calling me and saying, OK, so you are in the Gulf. So Bahrain, like any other Gulf, this must be uh, uh, an oil-based uh, uh, economy and an oil country. And you must be paid in the petrodollar. So I bet that I have been uh, exposed to this question a hundred times. So I had to do some research and come up with a suitable answer to that question. So I did some research, and it, it turns out that uh, unlike other GCC countries, in fact, Bahrain was the first post-oil uh, economy. And since the late 20th century, they uh, have invested heavily in other sectors to diversify the economy, like banking, uh, tourism, uh, financial services, especially uh, Islamic banking. Bahrain is leading in Islamic banking. Uh, many industries like the aluminum uh, production in addition to uh, construction, real estate. And also Bahrain aspires to become uh, a destination for uh, educational tourism, uh, if you will. And all this is echoed in the uh, Vision 2030. 
And then I came across a campaign by Economic Development Board that's uh, labeled uh, Business Friendly Bahrain, and they made this bold claim that this small kingdom is the gateway, the perfect gateway to the grand GCC, 1.5 trillion uh, dollar, US dollars. And Mr. Khalid al rumaihi in an interview with CNN, he said that digital economy will play a major role going forward. Hmm. That reminded me of a similar claim in my country where politicians claim that Tunisia, because of its strategic location in North Africa, is the ideal launch pad, is the perfect gateway to European countries who want to do business with Africa and to African countries who want to export to Europe. But it never materialized. It was not concrete as everyone hoped for. So the questions that came to my mind, if you make such a bold claim, really, do you have the infrastructure uh, to honor that? Do you have qualified manpower? Do you have the organizational structures? Do you have the legislation framework? Do you have an ecosystem for digital uh, economy, as you uh, claim? Is it mature enough? And so I took it upon myself to put that bold claim to the test. And I did some research. So the methodology is basically literature review heavily, literature review, secondary data, etc. And I came, I concluded with 10 points. I will share with you very quickly these 10 points. Of course, uh, in the article presented with you in the proceedings, uh, there will be more details, a lot of uh, history about the diversification, diversification of economy in GCC and in Bahrain, uh, a lot of uh, references. But I will try to keep it brief, especially that this is the last session of the day, so to keep it light and, uh, and brief. Talking about the organizational structure, the first thing is an active, effective, and award-winning economic development, uh, develop, development board. So very quickly, if we look at the performance, the, uh, by the way, the economic development uh, board was uh, founded back in 2006 with the uh, mission to drive foreign direct investment to draw FDI, foreign, uh, uh, direct foreign uh, investments. And let's see what, how they fared. So new direct investments in the past three years, uh, from in 2016, $281 million to 733 in 2017, up to $830 million in 2018. In terms of new and expanding companies, and they focus a lot on the quality, not the quantity, from 40, 40 companies in 2016 to 71 companies in 2017 to 92 companies in 2018. Now, in terms of new jobs created, and these are direct jobs, from 1,600 in 2016 to 2,800, in 2017, and finally 4700 in 2018. The uh, EDB won the United Nations Investment Promotion Award for excellence in boosting investments into the fields of sectors that will promote the sustainable development goals of the UN. And Bahrain has won the first place for the second year in a row um, in the Conway Global Best to Invest Per Capita. Yani, if we look at the uh, direct foreign investments per capita, Bahrain is leading. Second point, a flourishing entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, you can see in the uh, literature review that ecosystems are vital to uh, promoting whether uh, SMEs or uh, digital startups. So the entrepreneurship ecosystem is rather new in Bahrain, is rather young in Bahrain, but in the past 10 years, it uh, really made significant progress. And now, when we look at the ecosystem in Bahrain, we see that we have all the components of a mature uh, ecosystem, from uh, incubators to accelerator accelerators, funding institutions, government support entities, governmental schemes, working space, mentors. And we started to have uh, successful startups and role models and people who can share their uh, experience, experiences to galvanize and uh, encourage others to follow suit. Hosting major local, regional, and global events, Startup Bahrain Week, Global Entrepreneurship Week. Bahrain was, in 2019, chosen to host the Global Entrepreneurship Congress, which is a very significant event. 
in, 2000, uh, in 2019. Uh, also, the Global Startup Ecosystem Report issued in May 2019, so this is very recent, ranked the kingdom as one of the top 10 countries with the best startup ecosystem. And this is a major achievement, again, taking into consideration that this is a rather young uh, ecosystem. Point number three, we talked about the legal framework. So let's take a look at the legislation here in Bahrain. It's a very enabling legislation, the freedom to move capital outside Bahrain, so people have not to worry about moving their assets or their uh, earnings. 100% company ownership uh, by foreigners in most of the sectors. Very few sectors, for very, in very, very few sectors, you need a Bahraini uh, uh, partner. For most of the sectors, this, your business can be owned 100% by you. Uh, minimum capital requirements, there are basically virtually no minimum capital requirements uh, as of now. Uh, for Bahraini, they have the virtual uh, CRs, which really simplifies the procedures to create your business, so you, you don't need a physical uh, location. New bankruptcy law to encourage people, you know, and in the Arab countries you have this um, uh, negative connotation with uh, bankruptcy as, as failure. But this new law, you know, helps you to get back again on your feet, learn from your mistakes and keep moving forward. The personal data protection law, this is very important and it's very similar to uh, the European GP GDPR law. And finally, the regulatory sandbox, this is from the Central Bank of Bahrain to help fintech companies experiment with a new uh, uh, projects with fewer restrictions and lower risks. Point number four, lower costs of living and doing business, and this is very important. Now, as per a very recent report by KPMG, the total cost of doing business in Dubai and Abu Dhabi is significantly higher, 50 to 55% than that of Bahrain. This report was issued in May 2018, called cost of doing business in Bahrain in the financial sector, financial services, but what about in general, living costs in general. Uh, cost of living index, the same report says that cost of living index for Bahrain is consistently lower than the one for Abu Dhabi and Dubai. The current cost of living index of Bahrain is 20% lower than uh, Dubai. And there is a very famous uh, website called Nambeo, consistently looks at data, gathers data, and com compares data from uh, all the capitals of the world. And it clearly says that consumer prices uh, uh, consumer prices, uh, including rent in Manama, are 26% lower. Rent prices are 42% uh, lower, and r restaurant prices, groceries prices, etc. So, overall, uh, living costs in Bahrain are lower than uh, other uh, neighboring countries. Now, point number five: supportive government engaged private uh, uh, sector. This is very important, and in the article you can saw, see a lot of uh, uh, literature references that proved a lot of studies that the governmental support. Although we are in a free economy, but the governmental support still plays a major role in uh, promoting uh, SMEs and uh, entrepreneurship in general. And Tamkin uh, was launched with, as a national labor fund focused on uh, promoting private uh, and developing private sector. And one of their initiatives, subsidizing 100% of the startup's clouds needs, subsidizing 50% of the startup needs in terms of accounting, marketing, etc., subsidizing the workforce wages by 70% and their training needs by 100%, a minimum viable product MVP scheme with funds up to 2600 uh, USD. Also another entity uh, launched uh, not long ago, Bahrain Export, which promotes uh, SMEs to uh, export their products to uh, neighboring, to uh, outside Bahrain. Point number six, and this is very important as we talked about uh, digital economy in the, in the context of diversification. So in the ICT development index, Bahrain is ranked first in the MENA region and 31st globally, beating the likes of UAE, which comes distantly at the 40th place. Now, in the global innovation index for 2018, this backs this uh, information also where Bahrain beats UAE in terms of both ICT access and use. We'll look at the, uh, the table uh, in a second, but also let's not forget that Bahrain uh, is host of Amazon Web Services, IWS Cloud Center for the Middle East region. If we take a look at uh, under the indicator infrastructure, the third pillar measures information and communication technologies, ICTs. Now, information and communication technologies for the both IT access, we can see that the rank of Bahrain is 25, and the rank of UAE is 23, so they're 
uh, very close. For ICT use, however, Bahrain is ranked 21, UAE is ranked 23. For online e-participation, for instance, they are equal, 32, 32. Point number seven is increasing number of incubators and accelerator, accelerator, accelerators, accelerators, sorry. So again, this is part of the ecosystem that we talked about earlier, but literature shows that these types of structures play a major role in promoting uh, startups and SMEs. And uh, a surge we have seen in the past few years, a surge in the number of incubators and accelerating programs like Flat6 Lab, Riadet, Brink Battleco, C5 Cloud, uh, Nest, uh, we have Fintech Bay, obviously, etc. And last year, Bahrain Development Bank launched a new $100 million venture capital fund of funds called Alwaha Fund. This year, MSA Capital China, a venture capital fund from China has chosen Bahrain to set up their regional uh, office and they will be launching uh, their operations from Bahrain. Point number eight, which is equally important, connectedness and partnerships. So logistically, Bahrain is also very advanced and uh, in fact, it has recently been ranked second in global connectedness index developed by DHL. Uh, key strategic MOUs and agreements play a major low role in this regard, and just as an example, Le Suave FinTech Incubator in France, there is a memorandum of, between EDB uh, and Le Suave FinTech Incubator, there is a memorandum of understanding to promote uh, uh, FinTech uh, startups, Digi Digi Digital Jersey and Bahrain Digital Innovation Agreement also in the same vein. Uh, again, it fits to uh, uh, mention here that Bahrain is the host of IWS uh, cloud center, uh, and this is also an area where uh, Bahrain beats UAE on the Global Innovation Index, where Bahrain is ranked eighth globally, and UAE is ranked 14th under the sub-indicator Joint Venture Strategic Alliance deals. Now, uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning, do you have, uh, demographically, are you set for uh, uh, such a role? And you can see that we have in Bahrain a youthful, modern, and educated society. So 90, more than 95% is the uh, literacy, literacy uh, rate, which making it uh, among the top five Arab countries. The population pyramid is very youthful, with almost 70% under 40. This is very important. We have active participation of women in all sectors, including uh, entrepreneurship, and especially the IT uh, sector. And as a matter of fact, Bahrain has just stopped Silicon Valley, yes, you heard it right, and London with the highest share of female founders according to 2019 Global Startup Ecosystem Report issued in May 2019. So Bahrain, 18% of startup founders are female. In the Silicon Valley, only 16%, and in London, it's only 15%. And the tenth and last point, people just like it here. If we look at the uh, HSBC Expat Explorer survey issued in 2019, uh, Bahrain is by far the best country in the region for expats, fifth global, distantly beating UAE, which is 10th, UK 22nd, USA 23rd, and KSA 26th when considering all uh, criteria. Uh, this is the, uh, the table, as you can see, of Singapore, New Zealand, Germany, Canada, and then Bahrain beating Australia, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, UAE, France, India, Indonesia, Spain, Malaysia, etc. Okay. <laughs> Conclusion and recommendations. So back to the claim that we started with. Back to the claim. Does Bahrain really have what it takes to be the launch pad and the gateway to the grand GCC 1.5 trillion uh, uh, dollar market and become a regional hub, especially for digital eco economy? What do you guys think? Yes? All right. My answer is yes, but. I have some recommendations. After uh, doing this research, I think there is a need to create techno parks and more clusters. Still, under the sub-indicator state of cluster development, Bahrain is ranked 24th globally and the uh, Global Innovation Index mentioned earlier. This is uh, encouraging, but still trailing UAE, for instance, which is ranked second. 
Another uh, second recommendation is the need to create more collaboration between universities and industries. Again, under the sub-indicator university industry research collaboration, Bahrain is ranked 44th globally. Again, this is encouraging, but UAE, for instance, is ranked 24th. So more work needs to be done in that uh, um, area. And in general, universities have to play a bigger role in promoting entrepreneurship and consolidating the innovation ecosystem, but that will be the subject of my second paper uh, in, a, in, a, in a while. Third, the last uh, rec uh, recommendation is the need to launch spin-off programs initiatives. Higher education institutions should promote spin-off projects so out of uh, uh, staff or students' ideas. They have uh, especially uh, research papers or on end-of-year projects they can uh, create, launch uh, enterprises from the uh, academic world. One of the program I have been involved with is uh, uh, UniVenture, which is uh, a spin-off generator program in Tunisia that helped create several companies and start startups based on academic research of students in different disciplines, biotechnology, computer science, agri-food, media, etc. So what's next? Uh, to take this to uh, another level in the future, research based on primary data surveys, focus groups will be conducted with the foreign companies and startups that really chose Bahrain over other countries to launch their businesses. So we will conduct this research to really um, try to understand what were the determinant factors that uh, uh, made them uh, make that choice and really to try and track the quality of these businesses. So um, I personally visited some of these incubators and accelerators, and sometimes um, the offices, they don't have many people. And these startups, they are still outsourcing some of their operations to India or to staff uh, locate. So are they here really to make an impact and contribute to uh, youth employment? or? or maybe they are just here to profit from the uh, very convenient legal framework and all the uh, um, you know, uh, encouragements that they, they find. This is worth looking uh, into, and it will be the subject of uh, a future research, hopefully. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm only using the words beating UAE or the likes of UAE because, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I use that for a go very good reason. Is because now Dubai and UAE in general is the benchmark in the region. Uh, uh, so uh, that's why. But uh, also you, have a, you are making a very valid point. Uh, indeed, the GCC has uh, a unique opportunity under the GCC Council to collaborate on uh, not competing but completing each other and uh, there are some uh, uh, literature very recently about how they can you know uh, uh, they, they uh, uh, select be more uh, uh, specialized so maybe you have one hub at one region one hub for media or for real estate and the other re in the other region we have a hub for a different uh, uh, sector so they, they, they to avoid cannibalization so they don't compete against each other but rather work uh, with each other. So that's, that's a very uh, valid point that I totally agree with. Our paper title is the relationship between creativity and entrepreneurship intention among young people in Bahrain and Indonesia. Uh, it is a literature review and uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, I and Dr. Adil as youth we form a research group and in that, uh, that was last year. And after that, I went to a conference in Malaysia. And I met uh, Dr. Hadi Yati, this, uh, from the School of Management, Jakarta, Indonesia. And we discussed the matter of entrepreneurship. And we found how it interesting also in uh, this area. So we formed a group. And, and this is our uh, first uh, paper. Uh, as an abstract, you know the inspiration of government, uh, universities, higher education, always seek to change the young people's mindset from job seekers to job creators. In addition to the higher uh, increasing rate of unemployment. This also changed some of them to engage in entrepreneurship intention. So the concept of entrepreneurship intention is merged 
largely with concepts like uh, creativity. So in this paper, we are going to test the relationship between creativity and entrepreneurship intention. And also, we put a special attention to understanding the elements shaping the entrepreneurship intention among young people in Bahrain and Indonesia that can help organizations to attract more uh, young uh, people to become entrepreneurship. In the last decades, entrepreneurship has become the legitimate field of research and management practice. Moreover, creativity and internship have been critical discussion in the development of modern economics. Based on that, when we look at Bahrain, we find uh, many studies highlight that the fact that entrepreneurship activity is lowest among young people under 25. And there is entrepreneurship uh, people. However, most of them are older than 25. So this is one of the problems. In response, there had been a portion of government initiative seeking to unlock the entrepreneurial intention of young people in Bahrain. With regard to with regard to Indonesia, the Indonesian generation has a challenge and an opportunity to be an entrepreneur. Although the number of entrepreneurs in crisis this reach 3.1 percent of the total population in uh, 2016 which exceed, exceeds the minimum rate of a company. But if we compare Indonesia with other neighboring countries like Singapore and Malaysia, we'll find uh, Singapore 7% and uh, Malaysia 5% uh, of the total uh, population. The sixth problem, as I said before, researchers highlight that the importance of intention. University in Bahrain, generally, for instance, are called to mobilize more entrepreneurial workforce and help students to overcome misconception about entrepreneurship. Regarding the Indonesia, we find the Indonesian government set a target to increase the proportion of Indonesian entrepreneurship to at least 4% of the total population by uh, 2017. Here we have some uh, literature review. With regard to intention, remain a key factor in predicting effective business creation. In this sense, it seems worthy to investigate the predictors of entrepreneurial intent to build a more sophisticated knowledge of this concept. With regard to creativity, a study has shown that students with more ideas and higher quality of ideas have increased entrepreneurial intent. When you look at the relationship between creativity and uh, entrepreneurship intention from a teacher point of view, we found that some literature suggests that entrepreneurial intent is a key factor in stimulating future successful entrepreneurs because it could satisfy the fear of failure or barriers. However, this link is still not clear. For example, there is empirical evidence that there was a link between the role of creativity in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial internship support and entrepreneurship in Spain and in the UK. Whereas in some authors, we find that there is no significant statistical relationship between the two variables. However, the positive effect between entrepreneurship education and training and entrepreneurial ability has been demonstrated, but as indispensable factor 
through cultural and social norms. Also, while another study shows that shows a little negative effect was observed between entrepreneurial programs and the intention to become entrepreneur. Therefore, the challenge is to identify the types of courses that the universities should offer to stimulate, support, and help young entrepreneurs to be successful. For example, with courses closer to the real life situation, as uh, some studies suggest, and also the climate of on-campus innovation can enhance the entrepreneurial intention of teachers and students through professional satisfaction and self-efficiency, which improves the relationship between professional satisfaction and entrepreneurial intention. Uh, with regard to the model, this conceptual model, the model is based on some of the Shabiru's uh, uh, statement. And if you see here, creativity leads to improver intention. Although the construction of personality factors such as creativity seem to be less attention from researchers and to improve an intention. A previous research has shown a positive relation between entrepreneurial and intention. Individual creativity is capable of influencing the entrepreneurial intention of students and mediating institutional factors, family, universities, higher education organization, and uh, providers support with entrepreneurial intent. Besides ideas of creativity that result in new ideas would require the initiative to extend the ideas into implementation or to be adopted as innovation. Based on that, does this lead to the following suggestion, proposition, creativity has a positive effect on entrepreneurial intention. As a conclusion, it could explore the outcome in the contents of individual, such as student uh, or business and entrepreneurship courses or program, students of business studies, MBS program or business accelerator or incubator, learners may be the best sample to apply such study or framework. The possibility of having access to the individual potential of entrepreneurial talents and improve behavior could be advantage in reducing unnecessary wrong investment and the allocation of economic resources. In addition, it's possible to optimize the allocation of economic resources to more successful business candidates and entrepreneurs. Meanwhile, understanding certain criteria in personal talents and behavior related to entrepreneurial activity may be helped to help make better decision for career, work, or project that positively support. This also helps them to express their creativity to and to exercise their own innovative behavior, besides uh, contributing to their employer journey before start their own company. Thank you very much. So welcome again, everyone. Uh, again, uh, my name is uh, Hatem Damak from ASU, and uh, I'm presenting my second paper, which is focusing uh, on the role of universities in promoting entrepreneurship. Uh, I will skip again this uh, slide about ASU. And my paper is not far from what uh, Dr. Uh, Arbab just uh, present, presented about the entrepreneurial uh, intentions. Uh, basically, we are in the same uh, vein. I, I, by this paper, I want to demystify this, uh, this concept of creating the entrepreneurial student. 
because it seems to be an ambiguous concept. How can university do it? Uh, so I looked into this, uh, of course, uh, based on literature review, uh, secondary data. Um, and uh, I would like to introduce the paper in the same vein as uh, Dr. Arbeb. So universities today are faced with this new paradigm shift. They are no longer supposed to uh, produce uh, or graduate uh, job seekers, but rather job creators because of a simple fact uh, that the public sector is no longer uh, hiring and the unemployment rates are uh, ever increasing. So the, the, they are faced with this new paradigm uh, shift. Now, here in Bahrain, entrepreneurship is obviously one of the six guiding themes of the national higher education strategy, 2014, 2024, and this is also echoed in uh, Bahrain Vision 2030. The objectives of this study is uh, to look at what Bahraini universities in general are doing to promote entrepreneurship. And then I will take ASU as a, some sort of case study. I will uh, zoom in at uh, ASU, what ASU has been doing in this regard. Uh, this will culminate in proposing a three-stage model for entrepreneurial uh, education at higher education institution to create the entrepreneurial uh, students. So there must be a process, right? There must be a methodology that can pays off every time, right? And then I will extend some recommendation based on the uh, research I did to enhance entrepreneurship promotion in Bahrain. So the first question I would like to start with, are entrepreneurs born or made? What do you guys think? Both. Both? Both? <laughs> OK. So let's look at the, at the literature. Uh, successful entrepreneurs' attributes are more of personal traits. There is some literature, just to be uh, honest, there has been this debate. You can f find this debate in the literature. There are those who are uh, making the case that successful entrepreneurs' attributes are more of personal traits that are uh, uh, acquired at an early uh, age uh, and not taught at a later uh, stage. And some even suggest that they uh, may be related to genetic uh, factors. But the overwhelming uh, majority uh, agree that uh, entrepreneurship can be taught and should be considered as an academic uh, discipline. And there are some uh, studies that show success in uh, teaching entrepreneurship. Now, history and typology of entrepreneurship education, a quick look at the history of teaching uh, entrepreneurship. The first, the first course in business uh, schools started in the early 70s. Um, the first undergraduate course concentrating on entrepreneurship was in uh, 1972. The first MBA concentrating on entrepreneurship was in 1977. Uh, but the real emergence of thought entrepreneurship was in the uh, uh, early uh, 80s. Uh, about the typology, yes? OK. About the typology, and this is very important because I will base my uh, three-stage model uh, on this. Um, Tatila uh, reprises the depiction by Jamison, uh, which um, identified entrepreneurial education into three classes. Education about enterprise. This is learning about entrepreneurship, which is reflected in the typical theoretical uh, courses. Education for enterprise, this involves practical aspects that prepare the students for the actual business creation in the foreseeable future. And finally, education in enterprise, this is about offering training and education for established uh, entrepreneurs and small business uh, owners. So education about enterprise, for enterprise, and in enterprise. So I looked at what uh, Bahrain universities are doing, uh, like I said, the secondary data, whatever is available on their websites from you know, connection, et cetera. And this is mostly what they are doing. So some of them are teaching entrepreneurship as an elective course. Some took it to the next level, level and made it mandatory course. Some have launched business incubators uh, or entrepreneurship centers. Uh, some bring guest speakers and success stories about entrepreneurship, uh, and some uh, encourage their students to participate at university level competitions or national and international uh, competitions. 
I will take ASU as an example, what we have been doing for the, how old is ASU? Do you all, does anybody know? I'm sorry, come again? 15, 15 years. Okay, but I will focus just on the uh, past uh, couple of years. So entrepreneurship is uh, included in our strategic plan 2015-2020. Uh, the introduction to entrepreneurship has uh, been made uh, compulsory since 2017. Uh, we have been organizing many entrepreneurship workshops to raise awareness to increase the entrepreneurial intention. Uh, we, invi we invited uh, many guest speakers uh, we contribute to community engagement by offering uh, entrepreneurship-centered uh, workshops to the community. In 2016, uh, ASU signed a memorandum of cooperation with Bahrain Business Women Society, uh, with SMEs Society also, uh, and also we, uh, ASU signed a memorandum of cooperation with Flat6 Labs, which is a business accelerator, part of an Arab uh, network. And we try to promote research on entrepreneurship and the uh, master thesis and the research papers. And we include in the advisory boards uh, of academic programs members from bodies that promote entrepreneurship. We encourage and support students to participate at the various uh, local uh, and international competitions. And more recently, in 2019, uh, the university uh, also inaugurated its uh, business incubation center to help students uh, get their business off the ground. Um, we will also this year uh, inaugurate a legal clinic which will contribute uh, to which will work in tandem with uh, the uh, business incubator also uh, to help students with uh, writing statutes, contracts, legal advisory, etc. And most recently, as I mentioned earlier, these uh, efforts were crowned by our students winning at uh, both uh, NJAS uh, Bahrain competition about entrepreneurship and at the Arab level also they want to prices, product of the year, and uh, Boeing STEM challenge. Now, based on all the above, and uh, based on the edu uh, entrepreneurial education classification by Jamieson, a model of three stages is proposed as a framework to help universities create the entrepreneurial students in a systematic way. So with very uh, uh, consistent activities, day in, day out, year over year, you will get consistent results hopefully if this uh, model is applied. So, three, three stages. Stage number one, entrepreneurial education for the potential entrepreneur. So I call this the potential entrepreneur. This is everybody, all the students, without any discrimination, everybody, we, we start with the assumption that every, everybody can turn into an entrepreneur, okay? so. The, uh, this is a non-selective process, ensuring common basic knowledge. The most important thing that you ensure that all the students have the same level of knowledge about entrepreneurship. So a non-selective process ensuring common basic knowledge about entrepreneurship amongst all students equitably and aims to motivate students to create a venture, so to consider entrepreneurship as a career path. This includes activities like uh, teaching entrepreneurship as an elective, as a mandatory course, bringing uh, success stories to the university as guest speakers, etc., to create awareness and try to increase the uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, intention of the students. Stage two, entrepreneurial ed education for the aspiring entrepreneur. So now you have managed to create that spark, that intention uh, with the student. And so this is a selective process. This is a selective process focusing on identifying and investing resources on high potential students. Now you may ask, how would you identify these uh, students? You can conduct uh, tests, personality tests. You can call for, uh, uh, comp you can create launch competitions and see who uh, students will apply for these competitions. Uh, um, and you can uh, create, um, any uh, fundraising uh, workshops and uh, boot camps and see who apply for these boot camps. Uh, and the main idea here, and at this level, at this stage, is to help the student make the first sale. Because then it, he will be hooked and it will become addictive and he can see for himself that it is feasible. He can, he can make money. And this leads us to the third stage, Entrepreneurial education for the established entrepreneur. 
These are the very few of your students who managed to launch their businesses. They made it to the other side. They are no longer students. They may be still students at the university, but they created their businesses, and now they will need a different type of supporting activities. Uh, this can include uh, business incubation, continuous mentoring, legal advice, capacity building on certain topics, etc. So, if we uh, make a simulation, this is a simulation of the outcome of applying this three-stage model with the assumption that you have a university that is admitting 500 students and with the assumption that you will have a conversion rate from one stage to another of just 10%. So if we start with 500 students at the first stage, first and second year bachelor degree, if only 10% of them show signs of interest in creating their businesses, you will have 50 students at this uh, second stage. And if only 10% of those make it to the uh, third stage, you will have five startups of, or five companies uh, per year. Before concluding, I don't know how much time do I have. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, these are common challenges of uh, entrepreneurship education in general. Uh, we may uh, cite the need for academics who are specialized and literature show that the main challenge for teaching entrepreneurship is the lack of specialized academic staff members in this field and the lack of PhD programs, as a matter of fact, centered around this field. Uh, we also, there is a, we, we found that there is a need to conduct more research on entrepreneurship in general and to assess the effectiveness of these various entrepreneurship uh, related initiatives to assess their effectiveness. Uh, uh, we also need to develop more links between academia and the industries to foster the joint entrepreneurial projects and initiatives. Uh, unfortunately, in this part of the world, this is still uh, a work in progress. And the need to create techno parks to boost applied research aimed at innovation and value creation. Uh, I conclude by my recommendation uh, for how to uh, enhance entrepreneurship education here in uh, Bahrain. So I think it is important to start teaching entrepreneurship at earlier levels, not just at the university, but at primary and secondary uh, schools. Um, higher education institutions are invited to use, invited to use this uh, model to produce entrepreneurs in a more systematic way. Uh, and finally, HEIs should consider promoting spin-off projects. I mentioned this earlier also, of uh, student based on student research and even staff research to uh, increase projects driven from uh, academic research. Um, H, uh, higher education institutions should also consider collaborating with international uh, uh, entrepreneurship centers at universities known for their entrepreneurialism. A good example of that is uh, the Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership uh, at Prince Mohammed bin Salman College of Business and Entrepreneurship at King Abdullah Economic City. Uh, also, one recommendation is uh, if we look at the legislation of HEC, the Higher Education Council, we found that private universities uh, have to dedicate, so this is by law, have to dedicate 3% of their gross income, so 3% of their budget to research, and 2% of their uh, budget to um, capacity building of academic staff. So what I would like to suggest is uh, to dedicate 1%, invite universities to dedicate 1% of their budget to promote spin-off projects or student uh, ventures uh, projects because we cannot just leave it at the mercy or for the goodwill of uh, uh, universities. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, it is very, the role of uh, higher education institutions in promoting uh, entrepreneurship cannot be stressed enough. Universities have this uh, mystified concept of how to create the entrepreneurial student or how to become an entrepreneurial university. And I hope that this paper uh, brings to something to, to the table as some value and brings uh, a methodology that can be used and uh, brings result in a, a consistent way. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you.